welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited today to welcome Ryan O'Donnell, founder and CEO of Sunlight. Hey, welcome my friend. Hey, Julia. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. We're really excited to be chatting with you because we're going to be talking about technology and earned revenue, how we can, you know, scale the, our impact. But we're going to really kind of put this in the perspective of your voice and the lessons that you've learned um, with a really interesting career. And so I always love this type of conversation, Ryan, because it's not just theory. It's like actually learning and discussing something with somebody who's done it. What a concept, right? So this is going to be a lot of fun and we're going to really be able to uh, learn from you. Another thing that we learn from every day, and that is our amazing partnerships that we have with our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes every Friday, just dealing with fundraising. They're really fun. And then your part-time controller. Um, we have amazing co-hosts. We, I'm flying solo today. Uh, again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Um, our co-hosts are really amazing. They come from all over the country. They do amazing work and very different from one another, diverse work. Um, and so I hope you've been able to get to know them and appreciate them. Hey, Ryan O'Donnell. Okay. Founder and CEO of Sunlight. You've done a lot of really interesting things in your life. And we are going to get through, a, you know, the connecting points of those. But let's start off and have you explain to us what Sunlight does. Yeah, well, I, I recently started Sunlight uh, after doing a couple of different things in the tech startup land, in the nonprofit world. Um, but most recently, I was a foster parent for, for many years and uh, decided to start Sunlight really to do what, what I think is our kind of main mission, and that's to strengthen uh, America's social safety net. It's profoundly broken. A lot of people fall through the cracks, uh, and that's especially true in the child welfare world. Uh, so we're building uh, products uh, to help improve the child welfare system, uh, both for attorneys, parents, social workers, uh, and ultimately the kids involved in uh, the country's foster care system. So that's a little bit about sunlight and what we're building. So as I understand it, so first of all, bravo, because um, this digital divide that we have that is very easy to fall into and then you it's an abyss you never can get out of it if you can't find records or get a place where everything is housed so to speak or you don't have that access um in that journey you are really behind aren't you yeah i mean you think about what it takes to not just access public assistance i mean sometimes you got to fill out dozens and dozens of pages, spend mm -hmm. hours navigating websites that don't work very well, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately to get denied or waitlisted or stuck waiting on someone else to do something else. Mm -hmm. So you might possibly get some help. Uh, you know, I think if you're trying to get help, and especially if you're trying to give help, it should be really easy. And uh, unfortunately, it's just, you know, way too hard a lot of times to get that help. And in the foster care world, uh, if we don't do a good job helping folks, we're, you know, ultimately hurting families and we're hurting kids. So Right. I think it's uh, extremely rewarding for me to be able to get into the ring and do this from a, a technology side, because that's mm -hmm. kind of my background and, and expertise, but mm -hmm. bringing that into the foster care world, which, as you know, we've been talking about, has a lot of uh, uh, antiquated technologies, is behind the times. Uh, mm -hmm. Might not surprise anyone to hear that, but uh, sometimes it's important just to <laughs> say we got some work to do to catch up. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Um, and and I, I'm very intrigued by your personal story that led you to the intersection of technology um, and being that you've had a tech background. Um, it's a fascinating story and we need to probably get you back on the show and really dig down more about that specific product at some point because um, it's really an interesting, interesting thing that, and charge that you're leading. Um, and so bravo to you, bravo to you. I mean, it's, it's really important. You know, one of the things that I want to talk to you about are these lessons that you've learned and that 
I'm imagining that some of these things, they become part of your, if you will, your armor and your echo, your, you know, your, your mental ecosystem, all the things that you do, you, you bring to the table and it's part of your journey. But I got to say, I don't know if I've ever had a guest on that was part of the Guinness World Record, let alone a Guinness World Record food drive. Talk to us about that. Well, yeah, we did not get the world record for the largest pizza or, you know, <laughs> most people named Ryan who huddled up in, you know, one building <laughs> or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my like story as someone who uh, just wants to do a little bit of good in the world uh, started when I was in high school. Uh, I was a part of a team that set out to break the Guinness World Record for the largest food drive in 24 hours at a single location. So, you know, the, the uh, I, I say like the United States Postal Service, they yeah. do a, you know, a food drive across the whole country, every single mailbox in America. Right. Uh, we did a food drive in one place in the parking lot of our high school. Oh my God. So that's, I love it. that's the record. Uh, we broke it from Canada. Some, some groups in Canada had it. They raised a little over half a million pounds of food. And back in 2011, we broke it. We raised about 560,000 pounds of food. Wow. Now, you said something really interesting to me in the green room. And you said, I'm waiting for somebody to break this record. I would love someone, please break it. It has been burning a hole in my pocket ever since we got it. Uh, we have hoped for someone to break it every couple of years. Someone tries and they never set their sights big enough. They, they top mm. out at maybe 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds. So you really got to go big if you want to break the record. Uh, and uh, if anyone is out there, they're running a hunger charity, they're at a school, they're trying to think about what to do. Uh, if you want to break this record, reach out. I am more than happy to help. Uh, I would love to see someone break it. Uh, the record's right there. Yeah. So if you want to come take it, please. Uh, Come take it from me. <laughs> I love it. And this was from 2011. Yeah, yeah. It's been well, that that's long. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've had a few groups. Uh, every couple of years, like a, a Boy Scout working on his Eagle Scout project will do it, or we'll get a club at a college. Yep. But it's uh, one of those things that you got to go big. I mean, we had big partners, Walmart, Chick-fil-A, Wells Fargo, every church in our cities, every you know high school, every college was raising food. Uh, and bringing it by our campus. So you really got to go big if you want to get the record. Well, you have laid down the gauntlet, my friend. And I, I hope that somebody who's watching the nonprofit show today or listening to this will um, really take note and connect with you. And then we'll get you and them back on the show when they break the record, because uh, it's really a great thing. You know, it's it's an awesome thing to think about that drive thinking about what was the social media and the way we communicated then so different than what's going mm -hmm. on now that you could do that heavy lift um, in a different time is really remarkable. And I would think that somebody trying to break this record would actually have an easier time just because of social media. Oh yeah. I mean, we, I mean, we raised a little over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in cash. And this was before there were, you know, really large scale online fundraising tools, you know, like Bloomerang, one of your partners, you know, like yeah. there were not a collection of tools like that. You know, we were running leaderboard and fundraising competitions and Facebook groups, you know, <laughs> you were posting manually like, oh, let's tally it up and post it, you know, like yeah. you know, old school, you know, uh, we did the first crowdfunding campaigns, you know, before there were really crowdfunding platforms. Yeah. So there's so many easy ways to promote both events online giving opportunities that I, I would hope it'd be a lot easier, you know, to yeah. do it in 2024, 2025 than yeah. back in 2011. Okay. Well, we got to get behind this because uh, you're absolutely right. And it's uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing to think about. Um, let's also talk about something that you were engaged in and that's using technology for roundup giving. Um, talk to us about what you've learned from that. And let's start with what Roundup Giving is. Yeah, well, after the food drive, uh, to connect these two, um, we went to the food bank the day after. They had rented a whole warehouse for us. And the head of operations for the food bank said that they distribute about 100,000 pounds of food every operating hour. And we raised a little over half a million pounds of food. So you do the math, six hours of food, 
we gave people breakfast, but not lunch. Uh, so yes. I was 18 years old and I heard that it was like a punch to the gut. I went to college and wanted to do something about it. I figured there's all these fundraising campaigns, which back then, you know, a few retailers would ask you uh, at the point of sale when you're checking out if you wanted to donate. And a lot of times they'd ask you to like fill out some cards, put something up on the wall, mm -hmm. give, you know, five, yeah. 10, 20 dollars. I was yeah. like, well, what if we just made it really easy, like ground up and donate those, you know, spare pennies uh, electronically because uh, everyone's using their credit cards and have that money go to local causes that you care about. So that was really what we had created with Pennies for Progress, uh, a novel concept, you know, back in 2012, uh, but now a little bit more ubiquitous. Um, mm -hmm. Exciting to see so many people doing that now. Well, it's uh, in the beginning, this roundup concept it had to be explained, right? Yeah. It was like, it was a new, um, a new way of donating, a new engagement. Um, you know, we'd, we'd seen like the penny jars and things like that, you know, for, for local things um, at checkout stands. But this is a really interesting thing because it had to be, again, another intersection of technology and then communication to the consumer and then tracking. I got to believe that just on the, the tax side, that tracking mechanism had to like cause some late nights. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of infrastructure to make it happen. We were fortunate that when we had launched, it was about the time that like Square was getting really popular and mm -hmm. all of these uh, like mobile point of sale systems on iPads were getting really popular. You know, if you go to a coffee shop, they flip it around, you sign, you select your tip, you pay. Um, we designed a really simple interface where it could say, do you want to round up and show you how much it was? You could say, you know, decline it or donate it. And you could say, you know, you wanted to give to uh, one particular organization. The, the business could select one nonprofit. They could select a local school or they could give you a menu of options. So you could donate to support, you know, hunger causes. You could give to a local teacher's campaign on Donors Choose. Uh, and we try to make it as easy as possible for people to not just give to, you know, their local larger campaign, but like give to a cause that's local that, that you've probably volunteered at. Right. Might be your child's school. Right. Uh, and then to track all of that and be able to, you know, give an easy way for these businesses to support local charities. Now, what, it, what were your lessons from this? Like how hard was it to get into the mindset of a busy point of sale transaction, you know, if you're thinking about a coffee shop, there's always a line behind you and everybody's trying to go. How did that work? How did that get to be, become more comfortable and, and more seamless for the transaction? Well, I think it really starts, if you talk to, you know, these coffee shop owners, if you talk to someone who runs a restaurant or you talk to any of these big retailers, they'll tell you that the speed at which they can get someone through checkout is super important. Yeah. So what we would say is like, hey, when you're, you know, cash register, you know, when they have to like explain uh, that you're doing a drive, that you're donating to this or that, they have to ask and it's awkward. And that's like a very high friction experience. That's, that's not good. And that was kind of the status quo. So we made it really easy where they already have to click confirm. And we just said, you know, we're going to put a second button there that says confirm and round up. Uh, so we tried to make that really easy to reduce friction at the point of sale um, and then to make it really easy to like onboard. So if you were one of these businesses that was using any of our point of sale partners, um, we worked in store, but also in uh, e-commerce. You know, it was just a you know simple click of the app, really easy to install, really easy to like start one of these you know charitable giving programs. Mm -hmm. So that was equally as important as like make it easy to give but also right. make it easy to like set it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a lot easier to say no than it is to say yes. Right. When you're in terms of, of adopting a new methodology at that point of sale um, to your point, you've got people, you know, trying to communicate with the consumer you're trying to sell, but then you've got a, a comfort thing there the people lined up behind you. I mean, there's a lot going on in a short period of time. And at the time, that was such a relatively new concept, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. Um, we were really fortunate. I mean, we had, you know, thousands of merchants download our little donation plugin. 
uh, and raised money for you know a, a ton of different organizations. We were all students. We were all college students working on this, you know, in the the wee hours of the night. And uh, it was exciting to see kind of the scale that we were able to reach as kind of like a student project that was just trying to like popularize this concept. You know, now I see like dozens of different vendors that do this. Uh, and, you know, it's a, I think much more like integral part of a lot of, you know, e-commerce marketing platforms. A lot of point of sale systems have this capability built in, which is really good. Um, so we're just excited to have been one of the first folks to do it at like a national scale. And, uh, you know, it's really cool to see how it's spread since then. Yeah, it's a, it's really an interesting thing. So you go from this obviously um, exciting challenge of a food drive, you get partners, you turn it, you kind of, if you will, gamify it by getting the, the Guinness folks involved, which is not an easy thing, is it? I mean, they don't you know it's like a real official thing you don't just like okay we did it yay team give us the award i mean it's it's like a whole nother level um but you do that then you're going on to the next level of philanthropic engagement with the consumer you do this roundup which is like pretty exciting now you've got this new product um your case plan and let's talk about that in regards to technology, because this is one of the things that I'm really interested in, Ryan, after what you said about how we get our clients to engage in something that's so laborious. If you don't have the technology, if you don't have the technical skills, if you don't have power or a place to engage in technology, you don't get the opportunity to even really get yourself in line for help. Your case plan, what does that look like? Yeah, well, you know, really it's all about bringing some of the technology that that is kind of commonplace everywhere else, you yeah. know, in the business sector and, you know, sales and marketing teams and recruiting teams um, that is just normal. I mean, it's kind of like an afterthought, right? But in the child welfare world, it's a world of fax machines and snail mail and paper notebooks, right? And, you know, there's over 400,000 kids in our country's foster care system. And most of their caseworkers are managing their cases with, uh, you know, a, a paper notebook and some sticky notes on their desk. And uh, we just don't think that's good enough. And your case plan is really built to be a communications tool because there's so many people involved in the child welfare system. You got, you know, county or state social workers, you've got uh, birth families, you've got relatives, you've got foster parents, you've got lots of different caseworkers, lots of different attorneys. So our product really just brings everyone together in one app where they can communicate securely. You know, a foster parent can share photos with the biological parent. Uh, you know, the attorney can securely message their clients. Uh, clients can upload their, uh, you know, certificates, going to various, you know, parenting classes and things like that and really helping to just document it uh, and get everyone all on the same page so that we can get kids out of the system. Uh, you know, so they're not just stuck there waiting around for all the grownups in their life to get on the same page. Right. Talk to me about this experience um, that you're bringing, your personal experience as a foster parent, and then it's a marriage with technology, um, communicating what this can look like and how this works How's that gone over? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times people will build stuff and have no experience in it. Yeah. And if you're in the nonprofit world, there's plenty of people who want to sell you something yeah. that'll do something for you that yeah. might have nothing to do with what matters to you. I, <laughs> yeah. One of my friends, executive director of a, a local nonprofit, he's like, I get these calls every day, Ryan. These people don't understand what I care about. I care about serving my clients. I care about meeting my fundraising targets. I don't care about this, that, or the other thing. You know, I don't need to optimize for X, Y, or Z, you know? Uh, so I think it's just, it's about being able to build technology mm -hmm. from, a, from a place with some lived experience where you actually feel the pain of what it's like when things don't work right. You know, right. I had to tuck in our foster son every night and he wanted to know when he was going to go home. And I had to tell him, I don't know. I had to tell him that the next day I'll talk to his social worker and we'll get on a plan. We'll talk to with his dad. So you know, I, I lived that, you know, for years, I got to see what it's like when the system doesn't work, 
And, and I got to build a really close relationship with our foster son's uh, dad. Um, and, you know, most of the parents involved in the child welfare system are not abusive parents. In North Carolina, about 85% of the kids have never been abused. Their parents are simply poor and they fell through the cracks of the social safety net. So, you know, what I saw was that you really had to bring technology to the forefront to make it easy for people to navigate it, for people to know, you know, when they got a court appointment, when they got to go to an IEP meeting with the school, you right. know. And, you know, when you think about building a product, you really want to make sure it's built around the needs of the actual user and not what like some person in some room in a far off land <laughs> thought was needed. So I just right. felt like I had, uh, you know, the time, the resources, and, and honestly, just the, the dedication to like building for parents, mm -hmm. making sure that like, their kids are kind of front and center. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of why we started to focus on it that way and how we think about building technology uh, for mm -hmm. the school. So when you look at the trajectory of where this is going, again, you've been engaged in technology and where you've had to communicate maybe a new or hard concept. Um, how is it going? Like, what do you see, you know, the, the application, what, what's going on? Like, I realize that this is new, relatively new. What's, what's, what's percolating? Yeah. Well, you know, the United States is a great country. We've got a laboratory of democracy, 50 different states and every yeah. state. Some states have different uh, county run systems where in North Carolina, we have a hundred different child welfare agencies. They all do their own thing. In other states, they have a state run system. Um, yeah. You know, right off the bat, we, we've seen some really uh, strong interest. Um, we uh, are actually just now launching in the state of Oklahoma as uh, our first statewide customer. And we're doing some pilots in some other states. Uh, just because they really want to improve the quality of legal representation. They've got nonprofit legal clinics uh, serving uh, the, both the parents and the children involved in these cases. We also have all these nonprofit foster care agencies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the interest has been, uh, you know, really great just because, you know, in this country, we really have a foster care crisis. We've got a lot of kids entering the system, a lot of times for reasons not related to abuse, but neglect. And we also have uh, another problem, which is there just aren't enough foster parents. Foster parent recruitment's down, foster parent retention is down. Uh, so you really gotta look at the data and see like kids are often better off with their family or with a relative than they are in a, in a group home or in a, in a you know a stranger's home like mine as a foster parent. So you really wanna look at what are the ways that we can actually you know, provide a good, safe, stable, and loving home for these kids Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of momentum around preventing foster care, uh, mm -hmm. as well as just preserving those families. So we want to really help contribute to that mm -hmm. with our product and, and work with people who you know, believe the same. Right. It's absolutely fascinating um, because I've got to, to ask you this. Could you have come through this trajectory without having been part of the, of the technological business world? You know, I, I don't know if I could. I don't, I don't know if I would bring, uh, you know, anything to the table. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, states trying to, you know, build, you know, custom software to run their child yeah. welfare systems. And they don't have a lot of experience with technology. Uh, right. So, you know, in those states, they, they spend an awful lot of money and an awful lot of time building stuff that just doesn't work and doesn't right. actually help the people. I think it's a real shame. Because if we don't do a good job for these families, you know, they're the ones who bear the costs, not yeah. necessarily the person in charge with building the tool. Uh, oh, so, nice. you know, for me, it's deeply personal, but, you know, I have the capability around building technology. I love building great products. Uh, so it felt uh, kind of a natural fit for me. I don't know what else I would do, honestly. <laughs> well, let's, we don't have a lot of time left in it. And it's been such an interesting conversation to see this arc of your own personal experience and and as we use that word lessons um you're leveraging tech for growth in in your business and in your i would say that your social sector you you know taking your own personal experience with foster care system and then looking at that what's your message for other nonprofits because this is such an interesting time of change and understanding that growth is a big part 
of where we are too much, not enough, just right. I mean, and then factoring in technology, what are some of your wisdom points on this? I think the number one thing you could do, if you're, if you're a nonprofit leader, whether you're at a big organization or a small organization, mm-hmm. you gotta get comfortable with technology. You know, it's one of those things that if you're not great at it, that's okay. But you, you have to be able to have some skills in it. It's, you know, almost a requirement these days to be able to maybe not be a fully da- digital native, but to be, I, I like to call it dangerous with technology, you know, um, read up and, and, you know, learn what you can do. You know, yeah. if you use Bloomerang, uh, learn about their APIs, learn about what you can do to get the most out of the investments you already have, learn about how you can customize it. Yeah. These tools are really powerful if you can leverage them really well. Uh, you know, learn about the difference between a no code tool and a low code tool. You know, there are amazing resources out there for people who aren't software engineers who might have a little bit of a technical background. Maybe they're really good with Excel and they can learn how to uh, build really basic apps using some no code tools like uh, my favorite is Glide. Um, You can also build really cool automations with a tool called Zapier. uh, Mm -hmm. It'll help save you time, help you be more productive. I just think like try it out and like see how it works. And, you know, if you can fix one or two parts of your day and save you some time, like that's how you can use technology to you know, improve both your own work, but also your organization too. Yeah. You know, I think your mindset's really important because I think a lot of times we we look at products and, and we are on the website and it's like, oh my God, it's going to do all this for me. And all I have to do is hit a button. And then the frustration sets in because we haven't given it its due, right? We haven't said, this is going to be a journey. This is going to be a process. Um, we, we have to invest time, resources, energy, mindset, education. You know, it's it's a little bit um, foolish to think that something's going to just solve all of our problems, right? Um, and so I find that engagement piece that we have to redefine it or re-articulate like how we're going to engage. Um, and that's why I think I liked the word leveraging uh, tech for growth. I mean, leveraging, it, it's more inclusive, right? It's not just hit the right button and it's all going to be fixed because that's never going to be the case. Yeah. There, there are very few easy buttons in life. You know, yeah. but if you can figure out how these tools work, yeah. then it, it's like a secret weapon. And, and I think some of the best organizations are going to be the ones who can use technology uh, to power whatever their own mission is, right? Like there's a million different use cases. You just got to kind of be willing to go do some exploring and figure it right. out. I loved it. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. You know, we are spending so much time, Ryan, um, on the discussion of technology. I mean, you and I were chatting in the green room. The nonprofit sector has been woefully behind innovation, woefully behind in adopting things. And um, so we've got to be more comfortable with this concept and really look at how this takes our leadership and our our service level. to more people and to towards greater solutions. So Ryan O'Donnell, founder and CEO of Sunlight, check out getsunlight.org and you can learn more about Ryan's really impactful journey as a foster parent that uh, was the perfect marriage of his technological background and business savvy. Uh, And so very exciting work. I'm really just delighted to have met you and, and had this short period of time on the nonprofit show to chat. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Julia. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it's been really fun. It's gonna be great to see where this journey takes you, how it goes, um, because we've we've done a lot of things on foster care uh, from different organizations, and it is shockingly different from community to community. The standards are pretty much no standards. And so not that people aren't doing the best that they can, but it just is, um, it's fraught with so many challenges. And so um, good for you for engaging in this part of our sector. Um, I want to make sure that we also give a shout out to our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. um, So we can have these amazing conversations like we've had with Ryan today. All right, my friend, 
We end every episode of the nonprofit show with this mantra. And today it really resonates with me in a different way, um, making me think about tech and the wellness of our, of our ecosystems. And the message is very simple. It goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody. See you back here again.